Today, a film that I've been researching for years, The Death of Joe Kennedy and Project Aphrodite. Hi folks and welcome back. On the surface, this is quite a well-known story, but there's more to the story than meets the eye. This is the death of Joe Kennedy Jr. Joe Kennedy Jr. is one of two sons of Joe Kennedy, the Kennedy family from Northeast United States. Joe was his father's favorite son. His father suggested that Joe should become involved in politics after World War II and was tipped to become the US's next president. Uh, that obviously didn't happen because he died in Suffolk, England. And Joe's younger son, uh, John F. Kennedy, who Joe regarded as weak, liberal, and not suitable presidential material, actually became one of America's most famous presidents. The rest is history. But today let's talk about Joe Kennedy, JFK's older brother, and really why he died, how he died, and why the story is actually quite scandalous. So who exactly was Joe Kennedy and why was he involved in World War II? Well, that seems very strange because Joe Kennedy never wanted the United States to get involved in the conflict in Europe. It was only after Pearl Harbor that Joe actually joined the Allies in fighting with Britain against the Germans. I have to say, after he did get involved, he was an absolute hero, flying coastal patrol boats, bombing U-boats. He actually completed more missions than he needed to and he was due to be flown home. His war was over, but instead he volunteered for a highly secret and very dangerous mission, Project Aphrodite. Oh, I said Aphrodite in a very mysterious way. Well, it actually was. By 1944, the Germans were pretty well on the back foot, but they had a great technological advantage, and they started using V, vengeance terror weapons. The V1, which is a buzz bomb, the V2, which is the world's first ballistic missile, and the strange V3, which we need to discuss, which was the cause of Joe Kennedy's death. Project Aphrodite was vital. Project Aphrodite was also so secret, here's the original letter to Joe Kennedy's mother, not explaining how her son died. I am not at liberty to disclose the nature of Joe's mission, but I can assure you that he gave his life while on a mission vital to the cause of which we are all fighting. As you must know, he volunteered for a special detail that was exceedingly dangerous. By thus volunteering, Joe exhibited courage above and beyond the call of duty and contributed his fullest share towards the destruction of our enemy. So what killed him and why was Project Aphrodite so important? Well, first of all, it wasn't just Project Aphrodite. It was also codenamed Anvil. And places like this was its target. The Germans in Pinamunda under Werner von Braun had built this V-2 ballistic missile. It was ideally suited to land on London. In fact, the very first V-2 landed in Chiswick, very close to where I used to live. And it was so secret and so scary, the residents of West London we're told it was a gas explosion. But hang on a minute, just look at this picture. Mr. Policeman is obviously standing next to a rocket engine. Um, I think that gives the game away. These weapons were truly terrifying. They were ballistic, meaning they went up into the upper atmosphere and fell at supersonic speeds with no warning. There was no way of shooting them down and you didn't know they were coming. The Germans, run by a YouTube politically incorrect man beginning the name with H, and running a party beginning with the name of N, I also can't say on YouTube, thought that these weapons would devastate London, but there was a problem with them. They had an incredibly limited range, so they needed to be launched from northern France or the Netherlands. The German Chancellor, another euphemism for YouTube, decided that he liked large structures, and he built this place a V-2 launch facility in a hollowed-out mountain. 
It's such a fascinating building, and TV and history programs actually get it all wrong. It's famous for having this dome on the top, and it's assumed that it was a like a dome of St Paul's Cathedral with the building inside. Oh no, it wasn't. The dome is not hollow and does not contain the building. What the Germans did is flatten the top of a limestone mountain and pour a blob of concrete five foot thick in a flattened cake or breast shape, as the French would call it, to actually deflect bombs because the German Chancellor knew that it would be a major target, but it was not hollow. They built and poured the dome, the cupola, before they hollowed out the mountain. The dome was actually protection while it was being built. It was only after the solid dome was completed to partially protect the work to hollow out the mountain. And it contained this a V2 preparation and fueling centre. The idea was to launch 15 V2s on London from northern France every day. If that had happened, London would have been flat as a pancake. It was absolutely vital because this place was pretty obvious to destroy it, but nothing touched it. Bombs bounced off it. It wasn't until the genius Barnes Wallace came up with the Grand Slam or Tallboy bomb that he realised that you couldn't destroy the building, but you could shake the ground to destroy the whole mountain, tipping the dome and making the inside structure unusable by making it unsafe. Not by hitting the dome, but by hitting the mountain. So everything was being thrown at these type of mega structures. And there was another one, a one that people don't discuss. We know what V1s, we know what V2s are, but do we really know what V3 is? V3 was a super gun dedicated only to point from a hollowed mountain pew, onto the streets of London. And that also needed to be destroyed. But how do you bomb a hollow mountain with a super gun in it? That's what killed Joe Kennedy. The Allies came out with a joint, very innovative, very technologically complex plan. Project Anvil or Project Aphrodite, two parallel programs. What they had was used old B-17 flying fortresses and PBY patrol boats long past their useful date. The proposal was to gut these old planes and put 21,000 pounds of Torpex. Torpex is a serious high explosive to turn the planes into a flying bomb. But hang on a minute. Who's going to fly that? Well, that wasn't the plan. These planes were going to be remotely controlled flying drones. So here's a quick revisionist history from an old bloke. We all think in World War II that men with handlebar moustaches looked out of little windows and pressed bombs away over targets. Uh, no, they didn't. It was very, very electronic warfare. It was very technological. My hero, Robert Watson Watt, not only didn't invent radar, but what he did invent was radio direction finding. And that RDF system, Chris crossed Western Europe to make navigation points to automatically drop bombs on targets or to guide pilots to the exact spot to put a bomb in a pickle barrel. If you could take out a single workshop that made the prisms for U-boats, you stopped the U-boat production. It was a very, very interesting concept, but it needed high level of electronics, and that's what they had in World War II, backed up with great skill and bravery. So how are you going to do this? You're going to turn a B-17 flying fortress or another plane into a drone and fly it remotely. Well, there's something on board both the B-17 and the PBY that would help this work. By 1944, we had sophisticated autopilots. An autopilot can hold a heading and an altitude and potentially could be remotely controlled to steer the plane through the sky. 
if only it could. Well, that's what they decided to try and build. But in a very Heath Robinson way, if you don't know who Heath Robinson is, he's Mr. Uh, Botch It Together, and a very rushed but desperate program to succeed in Project Aphrodite and Anvil took place. Originally, it was going to be based in Woodbridge, right next to Rendlesham Forest. But Woodbridge was too important. Woodbridge was the main diversion airport for World War II with the FIDO system, the dog of war which lifted the fog. So lost or disabled returning bombers in a foggy night could find this FIDO burning runway, the flames were on either side, lighting up this runway just a couple of miles off the coast of Suffolk. It was very very important that Woodbridge remained operational. And Operation Aphrodite uh, might well have issues. So it was moved from Suffolk to rural Norfolk, quite near Dis. A US airport called Fursfield, quite near Dis in Norfolk, was used for this very dangerous and experimental radio-controlled full-size bomber research. Here's a picture of one of the bombers being tested, being flown over where? Any guesses? Yeah, of course, Orford Ness, which also had all the radio equipment, as you can see here, to control the plane. The first thing was to make the plane controllable, and then I guess fill it up with explosives, and land it on one of these V2 or V3 sites, which needed blowing up. But there was a massive problem. In fact, there was a whole bunch of massive problems. Today, I can share with you some footage that was recently declassified of how they lashed together the system inside a B-17 or a PBY remote controlled drone plane to control it. First of all, you needed servos to actually control the autopilot. You also needed a TV camera to look out the front and to look at the magnetic compass. The proposal was that the drone would be a baby and it's mother would be remotely flying it from above and behind. The mother airplane in the Joe Kennedy disaster was actually a de Havilland Mosquito. The other potential dangerous problem is that there was no way of automatically taking the airplane off into the air from first field. So two brave pilots would take off and slowly go through a system check of over seven cross-references. And here's pictures of the seven things that they had to do. The final step, once mother had control of baby, was to pull a wire out, arming the Torpex, and then jump out the plane. The plan on that fateful day, the 12th of August, 1944, in the early evening, was for Joseph Patrick Kennedy and his co-pilot to jump out of a hatch over Manston, Kent, just before it crossed the English Channel, and it would be controlled by a drone operator on board a Mosquito that would be high and behind the explosive drone plane. The mission on that fateful day was to hit the V3 supergun, which needed to be destroyed. But it never happened. Here's a breakdown of what actually happened on that August night. The plane took off, loaded with Torpex, with Joe and his co-pilot on board, and they slowly started going through the arming procedures and cross-checks to hand over control to the Mosquito. But to understand why it all went horribly wrong, I have to tell you a horrible story. Joe Kennedy was overtly racist. It's well known. The engineer from Project Aphrodite was a young black American engineer and he warned Joe Kennedy that the plane wasn't ready. There was a potential electrical arcing problem during the handover procedure to the high-powered remote radio equipment which might ignite the Torpex. Joe ignored him. He didn't trust a black engineer. I'm not just saying that. That's recorded history. So ignoring the advice of the project's engineer, he bravely did take off with his co-pilot. 
Here's some recently declassified of them going through the procedure of handover to the mothership. But it all went horribly wrong. En route to their drop zone at Manston in Kent, while over Suffolk, one switch was flipped that was the fatal switch. The biggest explosion ever witnessed in British skies then occurred with enough force of a small atomic weapon. Locals on the ground witnessed a shockwave coming from the sky and they described a giant black octopus filling the sky. That was the Torpex going bang. Joe and his co-pilot were never found. The plane and everything aboard it was vaporized. The V3 supergun survived. In fact, almost none of Project Aphrodite's drone-filled explosive planes were successful, most of them being shot down or just crashing. It was a mission ahead of its time. I guess they should have listened to the engineer. And here's two final twists from history that most people don't know. The crew member on board the mothership was actually President Eisenhower's son. And of course, Joe's younger brother, John F. Kennedy, did become President of the United States. Fascinating history. The truth is out there. Oh.